Thanks very much, Don. Fantastic. Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to this talk by Andrew Baharrell on the joys of the semi. Um, my name is Claire Benny. I'm officially a bit of a housing nerd, as has been mentioned. I'm an architect. Uh, I used to be development director at Peabody, and I'm now working with public sector uh, clients to improve the quality of their new uh, homes. So Andrew is your speaker. Andrew spent over 30 years, and indeed he's still there, uh, with Pollard Thomas Edwards Architects. And if you don't know them, they're one of the big four housing practices, um, and they're really highly influential in housing design policy and, policy and standards for about the last 50 years, to be honest with you. They are pivotal practices in the housing industry. Um, as a director, Andrew's led, of course, lots of award-winning housing schemes around the country, but now he's um, sort of stepping back from design and he's actually lending his expertise to PTE's Knowledge Hub, which is all about R&D, um, feedback and innovation relating to housing. So he's making sure basically the practice refreshes uh, what it's doing. Um, and of course, it's never just housing. It's always about the wider mix of uses that you need for a neighbourhood. And Andrew sits on several design review panels, including the London Borough of Ealing, which must be a very interesting panel to be on, given the amount of change that's happening there. Um, as has been mentioned, I'm a complete obsessive about 1930s Art Deco flats, and I write about them all the time. But Andrew's actually going one better uh, with his research at the moment. He's writing basically a series of love letters to the various home types he's lived in. And he's really thought about them hard and considered what makes them successful. And Andrew is a man after my own heart. He's actually concerned with the ordinary, which I think is much more interesting than grand designs. Some people may think the opposite, but I'm really much more interested in what most people live in. Um, so I'll let you uh, listen to him speak. Just before I do that, um, how many people here were brought up in a semi? And I was as well. So about a third, probably. How many people here live in one now? Not many at all, which probably says something about London house prices, I would say. Andrew, over to you. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, this is to record rather than amplify, and sometimes my voice goes after I've been talking for a while. So, if you if at the back you I start to fade, do shout, and I'll try and shout back. Um, so, apologies if I if I falter a bit. So, um, as as Claire has said, this is one of a series of pieces I've been doing. Um, I did one for the London Society on the London Mansion Flat called Mansions for the Many. Some of you might have caught that and I'll be doing if I'm asked back something on the terraced house and I've also uh, just written a book about deck access flats which will be published in the autumn uh, and as you've heard I'm, I'm really interested in, in the ordinary stuff because it's what affects most of us far more than the award winners and the exemplars we all aim to do award winners and exemplars and they're important but actually they don't mean an awful lot to most Londoners really um and Claire's already asked some of the questions I was going to ask I'll ask one more which is um who lives in uh, an outer London borough quite a lot yeah yeah and of course Peter Murray who's just coming at the back I know lives in Bedford Park which is um the original, the original garden suburb the progenitor of, and still one of the very best. Um, <clears throat> and as you've also heard, I do like to make this a bit personal. I like to focus on places that I've lived in or visited often or know well or, or worked on. And that's where I'm gonna start um, because in 1993, I moved with what was then a young family uh, to a semi-detached house in Hampstead Garden suburb. We stayed there for 16 years and we moved out only because we had the opportunity to build our own place nearby, which is where I live now in a PTE development. Um, and like many of our neighbors, we were only the third generation of owners of our 1935 house. And we know couples who moved in when they first had children and they planned to stay until they're carried out because oh i should be moving on a bit sorry i have pictures to entertain you with uh this way yeah 
So that, my, that was my house, this one here, for 16 years. Um, and that's another view uh, of how they could be. This is an imagined view because the point it's trying to make, these houses, they're big enough, but they're not too big and they're easily adaptable. So one family we know has remodeled three times, first time to accommodate three young children and a nanny, it is a bit posh around there, um, then to provide privacy for and from teenagers, and now to suit semi-retirement for music-loving bibliophile empty nesters, which maybe that's a description some of you can identify with. When we moved in, our house was impeccably clean and relentlessly beige, and little had changed since the 1930s, and we gently lifted it into the modern age, keeping the sensible room layout, lovingly restoring the drafty crystal windows and the cream and black bathroom tiles and stocking the teak veneered wardrobes with their original trouser press, cufflink drawer and tie rack. I'm not going to show you photos of that, it's too <laughs> personal. Uh, sadly, the people who bought from us ripped all of that out. Far away on a freezing New Year's Eve, soon after we completed our restoration, we got a call from our neighbours to say that our house had suffered a catastrophic plumbing leak. Uh, teapots with their lids on inside kitchen cupboards were full to the brim. That gives you an idea of the downpour sustained from a burst pipe in the roof. And the point of this story is that the construction of these places was so robust that the house dried out with relatively little damage helped by the suspended ground floor and the raised threshold, things we, we no longer are permitted to do. And the water just poured down and out and through into the street. Um, now, Hampstead Garden Suburb is a rather privileged place. It's rigorously conserved in its original state by a trust, uh, which doesn't hesitate to serve enforcement notices on illicit installers of plastic windows and satellite dishes. Um, but one of its greatest achievements, in sad contrast to most London suburbs, is the preservation of front gardens from being concreted over for parking. And it, Devon Rise inspired me to write a homage to the suburban front garden, which I delivered to Future of London at their conference a few years ago, called Privet Lives, and celebrating the many positive impacts of the humble hedge, impacts on the environment and ecology, on air quality and privacy, on jobs for gardeners and exercise for householders, and above all, front gardens and front gardening provide opportunities for social, casual social interaction. During the pandemic, they came into their own, as I'm sure many of you experienced, for socially distanced doorstep encounters. So book clubbing, hedge trimming, car washing, and produce swapping. These cliches of the suburban good life are precious everyday activities, which create a context for a sociable society. And reflecting on this period in my life made me wonder why this excellent housing type has been so long neglected, if not mocked by architects and planners, and to reflect on the future of London suburbs under threat, both from active densification, which I'll say more about, and from casual neglect. So a bit of history, and I should have said, I'm, I'm not an academic historian, I'm a practicing architect. Um, if you are an academic historian, treat, treat me kindly, but I think what I'm gonna tell you is correct. Um, London's biggest building boom, as many of you will know, took place in the 1920s and 30s, there's the voice going, with massive expansion of the suburbs around new commuter rail and underground links. The great architectural legacy of the period is, in my opinion, the semi-detached house. There are around 400, 541,000 semis in the outer London boroughs. The interwar semi is probably the most underappreciated of London's major housing typologies. Although often derided by the professions of the press, it's enduringly popular among residents and accounts for over 10% of our housing stock. 
The semi is endlessly adaptable to changing demands and circumstances. It was pioneered by distinguished architects and planners of the arts and crafts and the garden city movements. And it was popularized by the developers of what Osbert Lancaster famously dubbed bypass variegated. And I think John Lang and Waits, familiar names today, I think were major players in that period. Um, everyone extols or did the merits of a house with its own front door, gardens front and rear. Pairing offers the appearance and status of a villa and the practical benefits of a garden passage and side windows, which I'm going to say a lot more about, at a lower development cost and a higher site density than a detached house. Metro land or metro hyphen land as it originally was, it's now used with growing affection, displacing scorn, to describe the interwar outer London suburbs. It was originally coined by the marketing people of the Metropolitan Railway as it pushed out into Northwest London and beyond. Now, the semi is by no means the only typology found in the suburbs, but it is the predominant one. And I think for most of us, it captures the character and image of Metroland in both innocent times and in times of neglect and degradation. Nor is the interwar semi the first application of this typology. As many of you will know, its origins lie in Victorian paired villas, model cottages for agricultural workers, and the artful pairings of John Nash at Park Village, Richard Norman Shaw at Bedford Park, and Parker and Unwin at Letchworth. But the builders of London's interwar suburbs rolled it out as popular housing for aspiring people on modest incomes. <clears throat> and while the suburbs provided an accessible Arcadia for their residents, they became a lightning conductor for the snobbery of higher minded people, some of whom came from the places they so despised. And many pre and post-war writers described the soul destroying conformity and ugliness of the suburbs Here's George Orwell, who lived for a while in West, Ham, West London and Hampstead in the early 1930s. You might also know his quote about the suburbs being like a gravy stain on a tablecloth. Um, and I remember there was an excellent talk uh, at the London Society about 18 months ago by Jed Pope. Did any of you go to that one? Uh, whose book, All the Tiny Moments Blazing, a literary guide to suburban London has uh, much more to say and many more quotes from contemporary writers about the suburbs. And here's Os Osbert Lancaster again, writing on the eve of war. He said, it is sad to reflect that so much ingenuity should have been wasted on streets and estates which will inevitably become the slums of the future. That is, if a fearful and more sudden fate does not obliterate them prematurely, an eventuality that has much to reconcile one to the prospect of aerial bombardment. I'm not sure if he got in before or after John Betchman's famous poem about come friendly bombs and drop on Slough. Slough also a much, much underrated place, perhaps we'll have a, not in London, unfortunately, but future talk there. Um, the semi and the suburbs didn't get much of a look in during my architectural education in the 1980s, and Joe may relate to this, which elevated the inner city as an aspiring architect's proper habitat. And the closest we came was a coach tour of Milton Keynes, in which the greatest respect was reserved not for its many suburban cul-de-sac, but for the heroic reinvention of the classical terrace at Netherfield, 1972, with its emphasis on total control and uniformity. It's an amazing place if you haven't been there. But on the right, you can see how this grand vision has been subverted by residents' unstoppable urge to customize their homes, which is something which the semi accommodates without complaint. And I think that architects started to take a more positive view of London's outer boroughs when 
priced out of Camden and Islington, we began the great migration to Enfield, Waltham Forest, Croydon and beyond. And today there's some great new housing which shows a real understanding and affection for the suburbs like this inspired reinvention of the asymmetrical paired villa <clears throat> by Sergis and Bates. The side passage and the party fence are the defining characteristics of the semi-detached house. The relationship between adjoining owners whose two conjoined dwellings form a pair is subtly different from the relationship between adjacent owners separated by that mystical space, the side passage. And the competitive jousting of adjoining owners was satirized in the Bonzo Dog Band's 1968 song, My Pink Half of the Drain Pipe. Is anyone else old enough to remember that? They may be the best of friends or lifetime enemies, but they have to cooperate to preserve the integrity of the unit. Adjacent owners are physically separate, but the side passage is an intimate shared space with endless opportunities for social connection and social conflict. And I can remember both those things from my time at Devon Rise. There are three basic arrangements which are repeated all over London. Uh, so here you, uh, sorry, let's go back one. <clears throat> here you see the uh, paired narrow side passage with a fence, sometimes a hedge, but the hedges tend not to survive in the gloom uh, and sometimes removed either by neglect or by uh, agreement. And then you get the uh, wider shared passage leading to a pair of garages at the back. Um, and of course, these were sized for an Austin 7, uh, not for a modern SUV, which doesn't stand a cat's chance of getting out down there without scraping off the rainwater pipes and uh, boiler flues. And then you finally you get the wider plot with uh, enough room at the side of each house for a parking space and maybe a garage. So if you put those three basic layouts together and you couple them with the original affluence of the neighborhood, which they are found in, you get a wide variety of plot widths from a minimum of about seven meters, which is quite mean, to a generous 12 meters. <clears throat> and the side passage served and continues to serve several important practical purposes. Access to the garden, of course, for the import of manure and the extraction of produce. My wife is a very keen gardener and the highlight of the year was the delivery of three dumpy bags of heavy horse manure. Um, you can't take those through the house. Um, and that, that process, of course, reached its zenith in the Dig for Victory campaign in World War II. The passage provides access to the kitchen door a side door in a period when tradespeople weren't welcome at the front door and middle class households might have a daily help or even a live in maid. It provided access for coal supplies and the extraction of ash. Those are a rarity today. Together with household refuse, which is not a rarity, and it was a tiny fact, fraction of what we chuck out today. And the arrangement also enables side windows, especially to stair landings and WCs, and the location of boiler flues and pipework away from the main facade. So it does all that. And beyond these practical considerations, the side passage is a gateway to the private heaven of the back garden and the secret world of shed land. In low value areas, this has taken on undesirable associations with illegal substandard housing for disadvantaged people, including low wage migrant workers, beds in sheds. But elsewhere, Londoners have a more romantic view of the garden shed as a haven for hobbies, a mini warehouse for storing stuff and a micro business headquarters. In the iconic 70s TV sitcom, The Good Life, Tom and Barbara Good create a completely self-sufficient small holding in their Surbiton back garden. It was actually filmed in a pair of real semis in Northwood, North London. Uh, the side passage sees a traffic of livestock and produce and the goods even generate power 
from manure. And with their longing for a simpler, healthier life, they are the apostles for today's anti-globalization and slow food movements. So when uh, we at Polo Thomas Edwards designed a street of new family houses in Cricklewood five years ago, a bit more now, I think, we started with a homage to the semi, but we then persuaded ourselves that the space occupied by the side passage was better used to expand the ground floor accommodation, because we reasoned that today people want small low maintenance gardens more suited to barbecuing pigs than raising them. Um, so you can see here, it, it, it's, it, it looks like a semi, pair of semis pretending to, but actually they are linked at ground floor. And the benefit that gives you is a very generous ground floor layout with a sort of flow of space through kitchen, dining, living, back to hall and study. Um, but I, I now I wonder about this project now. It's all built and sold and very popular. Um, but I do wonder whether our sort of obituary to the side passage was premature, especially given the importance of gar the gardens have taken on during the pandemic, for those lucky enough to have one. Um, I wonder how many flat pack home offices have been threaded into suburban back gardens to support the new normal of working from home. Now, for all their virtues, the interwar suburbs need to change. They are land hungry, energy hungry and car dependent. Low value areas have seen widespread degradation of the original vision, loss of gardens to parking, poor quality extensions and excessive extensions and annexes, uh, sometimes built without proper permission, illegal lettings and houses in multiple occupation. But I think this is a good moment to reconsider the future of these expansive low rise suburbs, which fill the space between London's official growth areas and opportunity zones. But local democracy and multiple freeholds make large scale change almost impossible. Councillors and planners tread warily in the suburbs and conventional local plans tend to leave well alone. So here are some alternative approaches. I'll, I'll come back to this one in a moment. Um, but first, uh, most recently, Policy Exchange did a report last year called Strong Suburbs, which considers the prospects for gradual growth and change based on homeowners getting together to vote for increasing density on their streets and making some money in the process. And they did a follow up called this year called Create Muse, which applies this approach to those back lanes that we all know and love, uh, tatty back lanes serving scrappy garages and bin stores, which are common in outer London. Uh, now, I'm told that these ideas were gaining considerable traction in government because Michael Gove, of course, is closely associated with policy exchange, but who knows now uh, with him having passed on for the time being. Um, but uh, similar ideas were trailed uh, in a 2015 joint submission to New London Architecture. Um, Peter may remember this one from HTA Design and My Practice PTE. It was a collaboration called Transforming the Suburbs. Um, and uh, our report showed uh, as a forerunner, and Policy Exchange did acknowledge this, this uh, how incremental and small scale urban intensification of suburban London can increase housing choice and supply, promote economic activity, improve local service provision, and reduce car dependence, whilst improving quality of life, including green open space. Um, now, uh, uh, I'm not. I'm going to tell you, just summarise a little bit about our contribution to that. If you're if you're interested, uh, I'll give you a reference to the whole thing at the end. I'm not going to spend too long on it. Um, but PTE's semi-permissive proposition did this by extending permitted development rights to enable consenting neighbours in semi-detached houses to remodel or redevelop them to create more 
and better homes, for example, turning two houses into four maisonettes. And uh, along with the research people at Litchfields, we calculated that a 15% take up in the eligible areas, and I'll, I'll explain what those are in a moment, could deliver about 220,000 additional homes. That's just 15% take up. Um, and what we did was to set out simple criteria top right so it had to had to increase housing supply this isn't just about making your home bigger one house bigger and better um close to public transport and we sieved out green belt conservation areas and listed buildings um and then we set up a series of rules under headings of transport technical and design uh, here are the transport rules. So we wanted to see a voluntary reduction in the amount of parking, which we felt was justifiable because of the proximity to public transport. Um, and then we tried to codify design rule rules, which would ensure that these places were improved, not degraded. But we weren't trying to say you can regulate to create award winners. This would be good ordinary stuff. And the point is it should be administered by bean counters. It doesn't require skilled planners making judgments. Um, so there we go. And I still think there's mileage in, in that. Um, and uh, we had quite a lot of interest from local authorities, um, but most of them in the end didn't have the headspace uh, or the budgets to pilot these ideas. But one that did, I'm not allowed to name because there's a confidentiality agreement. I, I'll tell you it was in South London. Um, and we did a, a, a big study um, on their very substantial own stock of interwar housing, which included a lot of the semis uh, and very short terraces. Uh, and we applied the spatial ideas behind semi-permissive to intensification and upgrading of that stock. And here's a few images from that, um, this showing how if you've got a, a wide side passage, how and you've got control of the two um, uh, adjacent owners, uh, the scope for, for back garden development, but still preserving decent sized gardens and privacy. Um, and this was showing the replacement of pairs of semis by uh, micro terraces of three. So you get three houses for two, two of which are effectively semis, but the middle one is mid terrace. And here, combining those ideas into a new streetscape. Uh, we also looked at retrofit, and I can come back to that maybe later if there's time. Um, but uh, meanwhile, the suburbs are increasingly under pressure. So what I've been showing you is all about bringing into uh, modern times uh, those low rise areas, which we tend not to make a lot of attention on. What we are focusing on, all of us as designers and planners and maybe as objectors, is this um, because the pressure is to accommodate dense new housing development as inner London runs out of development land and politicians of all flavors lack the desire and sometimes maybe the courage for serious review of the green belt. And I know that's a very controversial topic in the London society, but the obligation to deliver new housing in volume falls on the outer boroughs, which cover nearly 80% of London's land area. And it falls especially on those suburban town centers, which enjoy the benefit, or some might say suffer the curse of good public transport connections. So if you visit certain outer London growth areas today, you'll see a vision of high rise erupting from a sea of semis in anticipation and, and now uh, actually with the uh, uh, experience of Crossrail in particular. Um, and so the, the logic of concentrating higher density development on well-connected town centers it is hard to fault and, and I don't fault it. Uh, I'm, I'm in that camp, but the reality of the way we're doing it can be, and I fear in some cases, is a world of housing units and dormitories. Um, and I wonder whether these places will all mature into homes and neighborhoods. 
And if London's allure and its property develop values falter in a post-Brexit, post-pandemic world, will people choose to live in the newly dense suburban centres or will they become a focus for those who depend on subsidised housing and have little or no choice? So whilst I'm not suggesting we need to do more of this stuff, I am saying uh, we need to do this stuff carefully and better. And we need to ensure that the new places we're creating today have the longevity of the low rise suburbs, which they replace. So to, to, to wrap up, maybe we should slow down the super dense redevelopment of suburban town centers while we assess their long-term impacts and we figure out how to do it better. And that's a talk for another day. And meanwhile, let's help London's outer suburbs find their proper place in the 21st century by appreciating their underlying qualities and encouraging incremental transformation, an alternative to the what seems like a choice today between total neglect or drastic change. So let's apply innovative thinking like strong suburbs and superbia, and let's apply new technologies like e-bikes, passive house and its retrofit equivalent enerfit to make them more sustainable. That's me done. Thank you very much. Andrew, thank you. Seat. Um, I just wonder whether we're whether we're sort of hearing the death knell of the new houses in London. I'd be interested to know what you think and what others think. I looked up a stat the other day which said that in the mid nineties, fifty percent of new builds were houses, and now it's ten percent. And I guess we've just got no space left, right? I mean. The reason the interwar thing happened was because there was loads of small builders, loads of land, transport was going in, mortgages were dead cheap, and it was just just thousands of these houses going up with all the right funding from the mortgage people and all the right building from builders. I mean, this is just a different world, isn't it? Under what circumstances do you think it's still appropriate and right to build? new build houses in London now? I mean, you've sort of answered that in your talk, but... Yeah, um, <clears throat> so uh, I recognise the 50% figure. That's what we were doing. In fact, even even a bit higher, actually, up to, up to the mid-90s. Um, so we built lots and lots of mostly terraced townhouses rather than semis, some semis in London. Uh, so we are still building houses uh, a bit. 10% um, doesn't surprise me. Um, we're building uh, townhouses. I'm lucky enough to, to live in one, um, which we built 12 years ago, but we're still doing it. You saw this, the Cricklewood scheme is, is sort of linked semis, um, but they're quite, you know, they're quite posh, they're quite expensive, those. And they are mixed in with um, small blocks of flats, which increase the overall density. So, but we are doing houses as part, as part of the mix within... Um, larger regeneration projects. Uh, I remember doing a project in Crick, uh, Collindale not so long ago, which has a tall building, the tallest we'd done at that time, which was 16 stories, um, in, in a mix with um, mid-rise mansion blocks of six stories. And then we also had a muse of two-story <clears throat> uh, courtyard houses, and they were affordable homes. Uh, those were for uh, low-income, families. So yeah, it does still have a place as part of the mix, but yeah, we're not going to be getting anywhere close back to our 50%. And if I could just also add, where we are building lots of semis is outside London, including in places that are effectively kind of dormitories to London, like Basildon. We're doing lots of semis. It's still a very popular and enduring type. And one of the practical reasons we like to do them is they deal with a motor car, because uh, those places still have uh, quite high parking standards and the ability to tuck them in beside the house 
um, rather than jam up the front and dominate the street scene. Semis do that really well, as do what we call bridge houses, where you, you bridge over the car space with the upper floor and make a sort of passage like a carport. And isn't one of the key problems actually that, I mean, I don't know if you're aware that 50% of London homes are actually houses, quite interestingly, in our existing stock. And that feels about right for the sort of demographics, the household types we have and so forth. But of course, a lot of houses have one person living in them. And we all know who they are. It's my mum and people like that. In fact, my mum's now size to a flat. She's very uh, special and clever. Um, but, you know, basically the, the distribution of families, you, you described a fantastic family life in the semi, which was my family life when I grew up. But actually that, that does run out. And then 30, you spend 30 years in it, blocking it for somebody else. You're not a you know um, housing market expert, but I wonder if there's a an inherent problem there with the life you describe and the, the wrong people being there. Yeah. So um, I mean, there are lots of statistics around what's called under occupation and um, people who dare to have spare bedrooms. Um, I have spare bedrooms. I under occupy horribly, and in a under a different regime, we probably have our house requisitioned. Um, so we have to be a bit careful about, um, uh, uh, I think, criticizing people for under-occupying, uh, especially at a time when, uh, and maybe it's a positive thing, uh, multi-generational collaboration, particularly over childcare, is, is very, very common, isn't it? And some of you are nodding and maybe participate in it. Um, and so we, you know, older people do have families staying and passing through. But I think the other reason, and um, we, we do a lot of what we call third age housing. I'm well into my third age, um, as of some of you, I think. Uh, we do a lot of uh, housing for older people. Older is 55 now, um, 55 and above. And um, my colleague who specializes in that, Patrick Devlin, is uh, was very keen to point out that the, the re one of the reasons people won't, those who can afford to, won't willingly downsize um, is because they don't like what's on offer. So our standard issue um, London plan space standard 70 square meter two bedroom flat just doesn't do it when you've got the lifetime stuff and family staying and all of that. So we don't build enough uh, flats that are spacious enough really to, to be very attractive. Or, or, and the, but the alternative model, which, which we, we do quite a lot of and which can be successful, is, um, uh, which is quite a common model with third age providers, is you, you accept a smaller home, but you have the use of fantastic shared facilities, um, including guest rooms, uh, and that can work well. So if we make a better offer for older people, uh, some of us might take it up. Okay. Well, I wonder if the answer then might lie in back gardens. I know that you've described back gardens and said, actually, post-pandemic especially, they've suddenly become more real estate, a workspace, a place to just go and hide from your family, frankly, storage, whatever it is. But I think they've, that's taken on a really mm -hmm. new yeah. value and meaning. And interestingly, I did some just hunting through stats, as I do, a few years ago, and realised that 25% of Greater London's surface is back garden. Right. And it, this is the real estate that we can't use, isn't it? And I wonder if, as yeah. you described in your secret South London development, actually that's got a much bigger future in terms of either multi-gen or, or a new home in there. Yeah, no, I've heard that. That 25% figure is amazing. Um, and there was a... <clears throat> There used to be a thing called garden grabbing, um, which was, um, I remember Jeremy Hunt was very big on preventing garden grabbing at one point, an emotive uh, phrase for what some of the stuff I've shown today, which is building in back gardens. So uh, I, none of us want to see back gardens disappear, um, but something's got to give, and maybe that 25% should give a bit. Um, some suburban back gardens are, are very large. You get the, the 70 footers, uh, which are not uncommon uh, in outer London boroughs. Uh, and um, I think at Devon Rise, we were 
So 70 foot is 21 meters, isn't it? We were, I think we're 15 meter garden. Um, but so the <laughs> larger suburban gardens where, where you can provide access in the way that I've shown, you know, they can accommodate uh, new dwellings um, and yet make sure everyone has, I think the, the figure we used in our study was a 30 square meter garden, which is not, not bad. Um, and one of our propositions for the nameless South London borough was bungalows in back gardens because that was it was huge demand for bungalows, which I didn't mention when we were talking about older people. Excellent. Right. Who's been thinking of a particular <laughs> question for Andrew? Please don't have, have no one put their hand up because that's always terrible. Yes, Peter. Hi. Um, yeah, yes, I, uh, obviously you were talking generally about uh, private development there, and one I'd like to ask you, how come they got it down to three typologies? I mean, Bedford Park, Norman Shaw had 29 typologies, and that was still quite repetitive. So how, how did that happened? Did they all get together or were, were the pattern books distributed? Um, uh, another point is, um, if, if you want ordinary, um, and this is not uh, private housing, but Beacon Tree is really a wonderful example of good, ordinary, repetitive uh, house design. It's sort of gone private under right to buy now, and it's a mess. Because all those things which you talked about, nice privet hedge, which were maintained uh, by the council, and uh, you know you couldn't put your washing out on Mondays and things like that. Um, it, all that's gone, and uh, and everyone, as you said, has now put their cars in the front gardens and put sky huge uh, dishes on 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 the front. Uh, so how 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 does one sort of maintain a place like that? Then the last point I would say, which was really interesting, I found out only a couple of hours ago, I was in Mayfair with somebody from the Grosvenor estate. And so I said, how much of these mansion blocks are um, affordable housing? And actually, it's about 25% of the Grosvenor estate is affordable housing. Uh, said, so, Yeah, but it, it doesn't really work very well, because actually most of the people have been living there for about 45, 50 years. And it's not giving the sort of affordable housing that uh, we expect in, the, you know, teachers, cleaners, and all the other things. And and that's not about size, but that's about convenience and having been used to doing there and just not wanting to move. Yes. So we had um, typologies, beck and tree, and cars, and we had. A very interesting observation about Mayfair. I, not, I, I might have missed the question. It's probably that the question in there. Um, I might have missed the question in there, except to say, if I didn't, I think I have already. That the the nameless South London borough that was local authority stock we were looking at, which was indistinguishable from the um, private stuff, except that the private stuff would have had the magnet front door and all those other things that you observed in Beckentry. Um, the typologies, that was my very high level summary of what I see as the three main uh, drivers around, sorry, if you have the pun, around the, the side passage and what that does to the, the different variants. Of course, you're absolutely right, there are lots and lots of further sub-variants, including numerous stylistic ones, of course, and corner turning devices, which are quite different, which happen wonderfully in, in Bedford Park, of course. And in Beckentree, and this probably should be one added to the three, you've got the covered passage where the, um, uh, which in private world is called a flying freehold, where the um, uh, rooms step over the the first floor steps over the passage you get it and that it still gives you access to bins and stuff at the back of the house um your point about the disappointing condition of beckentry um uh chimes with i think what i've been saying um and 
sadly, yeah, it's the middle class conservation areas that have managed to escape that fate. Um, and it's difficult to pull back from it. And it's also difficult to talk about the suburbs without talking about cars. Um, I, I optimistically, and having observed over my lifetime what's happened in inner London, which went, I mean, I work in Islington. Uh, same happened in Camden. I think they were the forerunners. By a mixture of carrot and stick, they they moved very rapidly. I When I first started working in Islington in 1984, um, everyone had a car. Lots of people drove to work, drove everywhere. Uh, you could park everywhere. Um, we built car spaces into all our new schemes. We went on doing that until the late 90s. Uh, by that time, we were building underground car parks because we were building denser schemes. Um, but look at it now. People... You know, unless they're very rich or they've got a council garage, people don't really expect to own a car. And it's the young think it's it's an expensive inconvenience. Um, we're not allowed to build them into new schemes. That that came in in the uh, early 90s car free development. So my point is that by a mixture of regulation and behavioral change and the availability of uh, alternative, obviously you've got great public transport in, in a London, but you've also got car club, electric scooters, e-bikes, which I, I have one. Um, all of this stuff is changing the playing field. And, I, and those last things was, should be benefiting outer London as well. So I don't despair about reducing car ownership in outer London. I think it will happen. It's just happening more slowly. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, and one of the ideas behind semi-permissive was, which I, I, I skipped over rather quickly, was that um, the condition of realizing the real estate value through getting permitted development rights to, to, to enhance or to remodel or redevelop your plot or your paired plots with your neighbor was you'd have to reduce car parking. That was one of the conditions. And that's why we only proposed it in areas uh, within 800 meters of the station. Um, and we had one of our rules, if you were looking sharply, was that at least 50% of the frontage had to be restored to greenery, uh, hedges and, and front garden. I think the, the rules thing is really interesting, actually, because part of the semi says to me, you know, Tom and Barb are good, good life, chickens, whatever, uh, like extensions, conservatories, you know, you be on the front garden, you're doing whatever you like in there, and that's the joy. But actually, Hampstead Garden Suburb, interestingly, had an incredible rule book, and obviously still mm. does, including no church bells. Um, Quite annoying, and there's no leaf blowers now as the kind of modern equivalent. Interestingly, um, you could have educational spaces but no parks, which are quite interesting. It's quite interesting. It's all about MES Parana. So, and then Beef Tree obviously had a lot of rules, and interestingly, it had like really big cash prices for front gardens. Um, but obviously, whoever you know eventually took it over just dispensed with the rules because they had too many people. Um, that just wouldn't follow it. So, and Span Estates obviously have loads of rules written in, and the minute you buy a property on Span Estate, you're, mm. you're, so I think as, as Brits, we love our freedom, <clears throat> and those of us that like a few rules are a bit rarer, but we tend to go and live in Bedford Park or where I live, or Hampstead Garden Suburb. Um, has anyone else got a question about settings for <laughs> Andrew? Um, it's about your, uh, the idea of um, semi-permissive um, uh, and how you get neighbours to cooperate with one another to try and secure some sort of densification. I think it's one of the characteristics of outer suburbs in London uh, uh, and elsewhere, I'm sure, is owner occupation individual owner occupation and independence and a fairly fierce independence now i i live in a 
a short terrace. It looks like a semi-detached, but it's not really. But I mean, I get on pretty well with my neighbours either side, but the idea of trying to get together with them to sort of bring about some sort of development, well, it, you know, it's never going to happen. And I, I think that probably applies for the most of the suburbs. And these ideas of uh, a planned densification um, of the suburbs, um, densification is occurring, of course, in a very ad hoc way, where you get developers picking off individual pair, two pairs of semi-detached next to one another, and you can assemble quite a big site. But uh, that's not what you mean, is it? <laughs> um, so the, um, the big idea behind semi-permissive and indeed behind HTA's Superbia, which is a parallel, but slightly different idea, and in the more recent stuff by Policy Exchange, which draws on that, is money. That people are incentivized by money. Why not? Um, so um, the idea is to unleash um, a thousand micro developers and to tempt you, sir, to become a property developer. And well, yes, but they will make money as well. And so, and um, many of us could do with a bit of that, especially in our retirement. Um, so money is a great incentive, isn't it? And so if, if people can see that there's something in it for them, but of course they're not, we would then great pains to stress that it's not just about money, it's also about improving the environment. That hence the attempt to codify and make rules to ensure that. So um, yeah, well, I, I can't say to you, we've done it there yet, which, which would be the slam dunk argument, but I'm, I'm very optimistic about um, people's response to um, that kind of enticement. Interesting. I have to say, I'm absolutely with you. I absolutely don't believe it. And I'm really looking forward to being proved wrong by <laughs> Andrew and by Ben Dogs here at some point about the idea that people are going to get together and develop. I, I find that I struggle with it, especially since they probably love their house. Yeah. Um, but, you know, stranger things are happening in the world. So let's see. Who's got a couple more? I don't know what time we're supposed to finish, by the way, so now-ish, couple more. Thank you very much. Um, I was really interested in looking at the wonderful pictures of your house in Hampstead Garden suburb and how well designed it was at the time, you know, for life at the time. And it just strikes me that planners and architects are a little in denial about how people live now in terms of cars and what you do with them. And, you know, Living Streets have this big campaign to cut street clutter. You know, we Sorry. cut street clutter. And just thinking nobody, you know, thinks about wheelie bins and, you know, charging points for electric cars, you know, in the numbers that we need them if everybody starts to get one. Um, and how do you solve that problem with limited space? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, as I said earlier, I think... I think car ownership will gradually diminish for all kinds of reasons, partly the cost of it. We live in a kind of never never land at the moment of these, um, uh, they used to be called higher purchase contracts, but most people own, they don't own their car, they rent it. And we all have drive around things that are better than we can really afford, um, partly because of the positive alternatives that are out there. We're not necessarily going to see a commensurate reduction in car journeys because we have you know, taxes on demand and car clubs and so on. But I think car ownership, and it's car ownership that, of course, drives lots of parking. Um, the, uh, it, amusingly, the, uh, the houses in the garden suburb, including mine at Devon Rise, although they had a built-in garage, it wasn't actually big enough to put uh, any modern car in other than a Fiat 500. And there was a ferocious trust architect very effective. I think he was called Wilfred Court. He's not, you're not here, are you, Mr. Court? Um, who I think from memory drove an MG BGT. Do you remember those? A tiny. And he said, if I can get my car into your garage, then I won't give you permission to convert it into anything else. Um, but I, so I'm digressing from your, your point and, and your question. So I, I think there are reasons to be optimistic about re reducing 
car ownership without necessarily giving up the ability to travel wherever we want by all kinds of different means. And um, what's sad and what Peter has referred to and I've talked about is uh, those properties were designed to accommodate one car on plot, possibly one in the garage and one in front of it. Um, but now people might have four, four cars, particularly if it's a house in multiple occupation, occupation. And that's what we need to start trying to row back from through this kind of, um, both through behavioral change and, and nudge and by making alternatives available. And one more, John, that's a killer question. Oh, please, no. Oh, yes. be gentle. because we've ended up looking at this picture and oh, I, I, I wonder there's there's a the, the, st the statistic of half a million semis in London yeah. um, thereabouts is are we overlooking the the resource which preserves London's diversity and actually nurtures it because the stuff in the foreground on this picture is baggy enough that it can accommodate as you were saying any number of different kinds of lifestyles um, extended families, religious practice, etc. The stuff in the background is too is is too efficient and rigid to do that. It demands a certain yeah. kind of lifestyle. So the more of the background we build, are we actually squeezing out the diversity that makes London what it is? And so the unseen hero of what makes London much more diverse than other European cities, many other European cities, is actually that flush of Metroland in a way that allows Romford to have the extended age of families, that allows Stanford Hill to have, you know, Hasidic Jewish practice accommodates that. And that very notion of the tension between the party fence and party wall is actually also what preserves a kind of civil society because we do have to negotiate. We do have to, to think about and, and in a way, a, a kind of classical ethics of reciprocity pervades, which again can't in the tower behind you because you are, life is made, is, is pre-negotiated into those cells. And so I think, I think it's, it's a really fascinating topic that actually should there be a preservation society for the, the bag, for the, for the responsive, for the, for the, for the non-standard um, as a way of, of ensuring diversity. Yeah, no, thank, thank you, Chris. Oh, you put it better than I did. And I, that was a, perhaps a statement more than a question, which I, clearly I agree with you. And I, I, that's why I'm interested in, yeah, you are. And I'm interested in not preserving the suburbs and the semis exactly as they are, because they, lots of it is not good now, um, but in gently bringing it up to suit modern life, styles and modern needs and where possible gently densifying it as well yeah and but also not not neglecting it um and um you know it's how we do this is is for another evening probably but but one of my concerns about it is exactly the 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 rigidity and sameness of the of the offering um and I think one of the, I mean, the London plan and the mayor's design guide that gave rise to the London housing supplementary planning guidance. I mean, it, it's, it's done a terrific job in, in raising and codifying standards and, and getting rid of some really bad stuff. But of course, what come, inevitably what comes with that is homogeneity. So we've got lots and lots of near identical one and two bedroom flats, many of them single aspect. Um, 